Binge the full week of The Ray Taylor Show ad-free over at InspiredDisorder.com slash plus. This is The Ray Taylor Show. Welcome to The Ray Taylor Show, where I bring you the reviews on the latest movies and TV shows, as well as classic and foreign films. I'm your host, Ray Taylor, and on this podcast, I'll be talking about all things film and television. Whether you're looking for a new show to binge or want to know if that blockbuster is worth the trip to the theater, or just want to hear my thoughts on a classic or foreign film, I've got you covered. So join me every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for new episodes, and let's dive into the world of film and television together. On this episode, I am talking about the newest Scream 6 from the Scream franchise. This movie came out this year, 2023, only one year after the last Scream film. This movie is directed by Matt Benelli Open and Tyler Gillette. It is written by James Vanderbilt and Guy Busick and stars Courtney Cox, Melissa Barra, and Jenna Ortega. In the next installment of the Survivors, uh, in the next installment, the survivors of the Ghostface killings leave Westboro, Woodsboro, wow, Woodsboro, and uh, start a fresh chapter in New York City. Oh my goodness. They are going, they are leaving Woodsboro, they are going to New York City. I think the only other film in this franchise that left Woodsboro was, I think, Scream 3, where they were in L.A., Right where they were making the first stab movie, I believe. Uh, overall, I love this franchise. Let's start with that. Let's start with some love. I love this franchise. The first movie came out when I was in high school. It was a massive hit, self-referential, referenced so many like popular horror movie, horror movie tropes, all of those things really brought the meta nature of film to this Wes Craven did somebody that brought the meta aspect to his own franchise of uh, Friday the or of Freddy Krueger of Nightmare on Elm Street uh which I think I forget which Nightmare on Elm Street was that like was very similar in a lot of ways to what Scream uh or at least you saw a lot of the elements of what would become Scream um but I love this franchise growing up in my teens and even though it had some rocky movies, there weren't some the, the greatest. I did rank uh, my sc- the Scream movies uh, on the top five episodes a long time ago. You know, I think in general, I like this franchise. It's not perfect, although most horror franchises are. Most franchises aren't perfect. So I think in context of horror franchises, I think this is a solid horror franchise. And this film specifically... I liked a lot of this movie. Uh, It's, you know, there are aspects of these new installments, the last film in this one, this kind of requel, as they refer to it in this movie, sequel, legacy sequel, whatever you want to call it, reboot of the franchise in some ways, yet still being connected to the original movies, that same universe, right? There are aspects of these movies that I don't think work that well. Like, they're interesting ideas. I just don't think they're being fleshed out well. I don't think they're being used in a particularly interesting way. Uh, But it is a fun slasher film, regardless of those things. Uh, But in the Scream franchise, you know, this is a solid, mediocre Scream movie. It is by no means the worst. It is by no means the best. But it's decent it's a decent scream film i would say and a a fun slasher film in all um which i will get to spoilers talking about specifics but there will be some spoilers for the previous film as i talk about kind of what they've brought to these new movies these aspects of these new movies that i don't necessarily like but i will be spoiling this movie at the end of this episode and i will give a warning before i do that but there will be spoilers for the previous movie spoilers for the previous movies in the scream franchise uh but i didn't hate this movie i liked it it was okay interesting doing some interesting things right the intro is interesting right they first off they're in new york very 
specific location, iconic location for a movie to take place. Uh, instead of Westboro, which is, you know, a suburban, I think, Californian town, kind of, you know, just in every, like, similar to most horror movies, it's just like your regular single-family home suburbs kind of a place. And they go to New York for this one, which I think that's an interesting swing as well. Uh, but the intro to this is interesting as well, the way each of these movies has kind of an interesting... Or tries to take the opening, which is usually a phone call. Somebody answers the phone. And it's Ghostface, usually, asking if they want to play a game. Right? Not always. And they've done some interesting things with that. I think there's some fun, subversive things they're doing this one. Uh, making it not necessarily the first scene. And then when they do, they change it up a little bit. So I, I appreciate that. There are many people from Woodsboro here. It is not just the two sisters. It is also the two twins. Or I don't know if they're twins. The, uh, you know, the brother, sister, Chad and Chad and uh, what's what's her name? Chad and something. I should have probably brought their names up. Uh, so I think four people. And then Gail Weathers obviously is in this movie. They didn't bring back. Uh, so the Meeks. Uh, brother, sister, Mindy and Chad are from Woodsboro in this. Uh, but they didn't bring back Sydney Prescott, obviously. Issue with she wanted to pay get paid more since she is the kind of the, aside from Ghostface, which isn't a single actor, is one of the interesting aspects of this franchise is that the costume is the monster more so than any individual person and the fear that it could be anybody that mysterious aspect of who is the killer uh is an interesting aspect which i don't think this movie or many really do a good job of right because this in many ways is a slasher whodunit and the whodunit aspect of it isn't as cherished or fleshed out or realized as the slasher aspect of it which i think is is if they were to do a solid whodunit within this flasher slasher type of a framework i think it would be so much better but i think it's trying to do so many things it's trying to do so many things and i think it just falls under the weight of all the things it's trying to do right so you have some characters from the original, or from the last film, I should say, right? You have a lot of people from Woodsboro now in, not a lot, four people in New York. There's a lot of brutal kills in this movie. There's a lot of different masks, because they are in New York. It is Halloween. The stab movies exist in this universe, which are based on the killing, so the ghost-faced costume is a thing in these movies as well so because it's halloween of course there's going to be tons of people wearing that costume which i think it adds to brings a lot of potential for what this movie could have been and there's definitely scenes where they use that to a good level but regardless a lot of mass a lot of blood probably the bloodiest scream film i think the, out of all of them uh and there's a lot of paranoia because obviously the whodunit aspect of it the the fear of anybody could be the killer i think there's there's a lot of very good elements to these films the paranoia aspect the mist like the whodunit the the fact that anybody could wear this mask there's so many things that give this franchise so much potential to be better than some of these movies that that come out and it's kind of a bummer not that i didn't like this movie it's just like i want more right it's a franchise i like i want more from it but the change of scenery is fun but doesn't seem to be really used to that great effect like there's no real iconic locations like at no point like you would think if they're doing a scream movie in new york there would be at least one scene where somebody is running away, like there would be one chase scene in Times Square 
where somebody's running away from a ghost face, right? That you'd think there would just be some iconic New York locations featured in this film that's supposed to be taking place in New York, which I don't think they filmed it in New York. I forget where they filmed it, but they didn't film it in New York. So, so you get like stereotypical type of New York locations, like a bodega, like a subway, like apartments, those sorts of things. But you don't, it never really feel. it could just be any city. It never feels like they are in New York. So lost potential there, lost potential there. And huge apartments, by the way. Like, I don't know how much money these college kids have. But they are in a massive, and I know how expensive New York is. Or at least I have a pretty good idea of how expensive New York is. And even though they have multiple roommates, it is a massive, massive apartment that they live in. And Gail. Gail has the, the place she's living is massive too. But, I, you know, I guess her books, these things, she could have that money. Still massive, massive. So because Halloween, a lot of people in costume, a lot of people in general, some of these scenes, it almost felt like there were too many people. Like, I understand New York, busy place, a lot of people there. But it's like, in every scene, there are so many people. And then in some scenes, like there's an opening scene, takes place like, on uh, uh, like one of the least busy, least popular streets. Uh, and there's just, like, nobody around. So it's like, there's tons of people around when they need tons of people. And there's, like, there's, I don't know, it's so inconsistent. And it's interesting, like, you know, they a lot of the cost, everybody's wearing the, not everybody, there's a lot of people wearing the ghost face mask because of the stab movies in this these franchises. But we never as the audience, have never really seen much of the Stab movies. Obviously, they are, in this universe, what Scream is in a lot of ways, right? So they should be the, the Scream movies, but in the own, like, weirdo universe of these movies. But because of that, there's aspects of this movie that, like, I'm almost confused at what I'm looking at as if because there's elements of this where it's like am i looking at a prop from the stab film or am i looking at evidence from the quote-unquote actual crime so i don't know because there are so many layers to not only just the meta aspect of this like of of referencing horror movies in general but also referencing events that happened in the real world quote-unquote in this movie universe but also referencing the movies so it's it's like hard to parse out what exactly is being referenced to in any given moment in some instances and there's this trend i noticed that's also in this movie and in many of this the sequels where there will be a kill one of the killers right sometimes one killer sometimes multiple killers right but there's this thing they do where there's a character that's doing this like over the top, clearly trying to do a what Matthew Lillard did in the first movie, right? Very over, over the top, but Matthew Lillard is a very specific actor that can really pull off an over the top kind of almost cartoonish type of performance. But that is like, that is like Matthew Lillard. In the same way that, like, Jim Carrey can almost be a real-life animated character, Matthew Lillard has that same ability to deliver a performance that seems over the top, that would be over the top for anybody else, but he can pull it off. And it seems like e there's so many characters in these movies that are trying to do an impression of that. They are trying to do, and but they're just not that kind of actor. And it just, it takes me out. Like, the... Uh, the second movie in the franchise did this, which there's a lot of similarities to this movie and the second movie in the franchise, right? They're both kids are in college, film school, like some people are studying film, obviously, because 
referencing film is a big aspect of these movies. There's a location that's there's m- multiple locations in this movie that are similar to locations where scenes took place in the second movie. And in that mo- in the second movie, there is a character, I forget the actor's name, one of the killers, and he's doing a Matthew Lillard impression. It's seemingly so over the top, but does not pull it off at all. It is so off-putting. Is it the second film or the third film? I think it's the second film. Um, yeah. And, and, it's, and it's this weird trend that I've noticed, because there's a character in here that is doing more... And it doesn't work. They're just not that kind of an actor. right? You need to have an actor that can be goofy to pull off an over-the-top performance. And the actor that does it in this one doesn't. I don't, don't buy it at all. Let's take a quick break from this episode because I want to talk about... Are you looking for the perfect gift for that art lover in your life? Look no further than InspireDisorder.com. Our gift cards can be used to purchase original artwork from The Many Faces, a collection of over 2,000 original abstract ink portraits. These one-of-a-kind pieces make for a truly unique and meaningful gift. But that's not all. Our gift cards can also be used to purchase high quality prints and t-shirts featuring these amazing paintings. Plus, if the recipient is a fan of the Ray Taylor show, they can use the gift card to purchase merchandise from the show as well. So why wait? Head on over to InspireDisorder.com and purchase a gift card today. Your loved one will be sure to appreciate the thought and creativity behind such a unique gift. Thank you for considering InspireDisorder.com for all of your gift needs. And now, back to the show. And there's, with these new movies, the aspect of these stories regarding Sam, who is, you know, one of the girls of Sam and Tara, Jenna Ortega, and uh, Melissa Barra and their two sisters we find out in the first movie that Sam is the child of Billy Loomis one of the murderers from the first movie and in the last movie Scream 2022 there's scenes where she visual she sees Billy and she has these like she has like a blood thirst Right, she has like this. She she has a taste for killing that she got in the first movie, and it's just a weird aspect to these newer movies that I think is trying to do what the originals did, where it's like the children pay for the sins of their parents. Right, Sydney, her mom cheated on. She was she was uh, having these affairs. Right, and then. Sydney's the one having to pay for these affairs where people are trying to get revenge on her. And in some ways, I think they're trying to do the same thing with Sam, but it doesn't work. The visualizing Billy, who's still got his teenage haircut, but looks like he's, you know, in his 40s. Like, it just doesn't, it doesn't, it does I, it's not used very effectively, and doesn't fit with things it doesn't like her character doesn't change that much aside from her ability to stab fast but i don't know maybe it will lead to something i can't imagine that they've they implemented this in order to have it pay off multiple films later i can't imagine that they had some master plan of how this would all come back they could definitely do something interesting with it definitely but so far they haven't so far it doesn't really it doesn't feel like it means anything like maybe they could do like a darth vader luke skywalker type of a thing clearly it's like but they're not doing that like it's there for them to do something like that but it doesn't seem to be what they're interested in doing with that i don't know You know, she's using her violence for good, where Billy used it for evil. I don't know. And like I said, a lot of similarities to the second film. And there's a character from one of the previous films that I don't want to mention who it is. I'll talk about him in spoilers. There's a character from one of the previous films, which was one of the better Scream films, that comes back into this movie. 
but it feels like tacked on like it doesn't really it actually made the character less great like they were a great character in the film that they were in but then coming back to this one it's kind of a bummer it does that like i don't buy it i don't buy it at all like it, it just felt like they it felt like they wanted to have a a reference like we got to have like we got to bring in especially since that probably they did it because they didn't have sydney coming back right so they'll bring back this other character for nostalgic purposes but i don't know i didn't think it was used that great um And like I said before, the amount of meta-ness of it almost feels like Saw had this similar issue where the way the first Saw film was written, they tried to keep that up where it's like making it just like became a bigger, more tangled ball of string the more the Saw franchises got, where it just got too confusing and almost collapsed under the weight of its its, its bulkiness. It's like unneeded baggage that is trying to weave all of these different storylines throughout the many different movies. And this movie, because it's so self-referential, it f like kind of suffers from a similar thing. I think it's doing a different thing than what Saw is doing, but I think the fact that it's it's like so beholden to making everything fit back within this while also trying to be meta i think it just it's just too much for it but it's a good film you know there's there's some brutal kills right a lot of a lot of kills in this one does some interesting things it tries to take some swings new location interesting it like fails i think where it's trying to force different tropes from the previous films and the whole sam and billy thing is just it's just i don't it's just I, it's not it doesn't like it doesn't add it only takes away it doesn't really it's, not, it's so unnecessary i mean it's the only necessary part i guess is that which it doesn't even need to be billy the whole paying for the sins of your parents idea doesn't need to like the events of the first film, I mean, they would have had to change the first film in order to not have to deal with it in this one. I mean, they could have done it. She's going to therapy. Sam's going to therapy, at least at the beginning of this film. So it's like maybe it's like, oh, it's something that's behind. I don't know. I just think it's something that they added in the last film that just didn't work. And now, because it's there, they have to continue doing it. And they still, I think it's possible to make it work. I think it's possible to make it super interesting. But I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I do want to talk about spoilers for this film. I think it's it's a good slasher film. It's a mediocre scream film. I liked a lot of what they were trying to do. I just think it didn't succeed at a lot of those things and tried to do too much that was in reference to the second film specifically. Um but I want to talk about specifics. So spoilers from here on out for Scream 6. So the beginning you have like an interesting... First off, you get the call, the phone ringing, and then you realize it's just a restaurant, right? It's just to set up that there's this character waiting for a date in a restaurant. And the guy acts like he's lost, and then she goes out, and she goes. It's one of the few scenes in this movie where they're in New York, and there's not hundreds of people on set there's not like this the frames aren't filled with like hundreds of different extras just walking around in costumes but this character when she gets led into the alley and then it just doesn't make any sense it's like obviously there's moments in horror films where people are making bad decisions and you're yelling at the screen barbarian has probably the most visceral example of that i've never yelled at my screen as much as when i was watching barbarian but it was done in such a like plausible way where i can understand why somebody would do those things even though they're the wrong things to do knowing that we're watching a, a slasher film but in this one didn't buy it 
I also, you know, didn't really care about that character. I don't, I don't know. I just like it, although it was interesting because we see who the, the killer is. Right. And we see that like, like the second film, film students also kind of similar to the fourth film, these film students who want are like practicing. They're like practicing to be the ghost face killer to attack Sam and Tara so I think all that stuff is interesting. And Tara is friends with the guy that killed the the lady at the beginning. So like I think all that kind of stuff is interesting. And the misdirect of them then them getting killed, how that turns out where you have, you know, the guy and the one of the roommates chopped up in the refrigerator and the other guy getting killed. Like it's a very interesting intro i enjoyed the intro to this like that misdirect of what we think we're going to be watching right all the characters in this you know they're interesting characters sam right she's in therapy she tells her therapist that she sees billy loomis right that she's billy loomis's daughter and there's apparently all these internet conspiracies that came up so it's like you know they introduce internet conspiracies Something that we're dealing with in modern, in real life, people believing in absolute garbage, and an interesting thing that they could have used, doesn't seem like it was used to that great effect, only seems to be used in order to make it seem like Sam is a suspect. That's it. It could have been so, like, the the opportunity, these, like, missed opportunities. And then their therapist, in, like, just like gets super nervous and like threatens to call the police because she she mentions that when she killed the her ex right her boyfriend in the second one that was one of the ghost face killers that she kind of liked it right so the th therapist is all nervous i gotta report you it's like i didn't i'm not gonna commit a crime i just said i kind of liked it and obviously it's the genetics the billy loomis genetics are flowing through her that's why she liked it I don't know. I didn't like the whole therapist thing just seemed kind of stupid. Then you go back and you see the type of apartment that her and Tara are living in. Massive apartment. Uh, and then like, you know, towards the end, you see her visualize Billy when they're at the theater in the shrine. And I just don't know where they're going with this, her being Billy Loomis's kid. Aside from her, like, stabbing fast. Like, that is the only characteristic that seems like... It, it like, is... The, like, the Billy Loomis thing is only there to explain why she likes to stab fast. Like, she gets... Like, she loses control when she's stabbing, you know kind of br brutal you know but she's killing bad guys so it's like i don't know you know it's i don't know it just seems it just it just seems like it's a lot for a little and then you have T tara her, by by jenna ortega right she's friends with the film students that end up getting killed and for whatever reason doesn't think that that's related any anyway when they find out that those two guys who she's friends with in school or had ghost face masks they were killed like she doesn't think that is at all related so dumb like i kind of the the tara character in the this movie is like she's definitely not the sam is by far the main focus of these movies right she has the connection with billy she's the one that the ghost face is after she's the new sydney Right. So Tara is like this side person, just her sister that she f Sam feels like she needs to protect, even though she's the tar Sam's the target. But then also just how Tara is so like unwilling to connect the dots and like wants to be like one of the themes of her character is wanting to be independent, wanting to her sister to let go in some cases, literally for her sister to let go. Which is an interesting thing. Again, not handled. Not Nothing really interesting comes of it. right? We see her at a party. We see Tara wanting to get drunk and make bad decisions. And then her friends are there to stop her from doing that. 
and she's like she's you know but like she's also makes bad decisions she tries to just she tries to like blow off the fact that these people she knows had go that were clearly ghost faces right i it's just i i don't know it bugged me it bugged me just, just kind of like a nothing character which is sad because i like jenna ortega wednesday amazing she's a great actress you know in the things i've seen she was great in the last one she was far more of a a main character in the last one versus this one but most things revolve around sam and her ex richie you have chad and mindy the two twins i think from that were uh randy's kids right which is fun you know randy the movie nerd laying out the rules now his daughter mindy following in his footsteps chad just kind of like nice guy whatever very much chad like his his name his name is about as vanilla as his character like he's just kind of a nothing character ends up the the kind of love connection between him and tara uh, you know i think it's only there to make it seem like when he does get stabbed in this movie that like we care it's like oh they just kissed and now he's getting stabbed a bunch of times and there's a scene like what randy would do where mindy kind of gives the whole rules of the requel sequel breakdown Right, the whole idea that they're in a franchise. The only purpose is to pump up the IP. Anyone can die, right? And then the fact that these two characters, what th happens to them in this movie, and the fact that they live is just like kind of ridiculous. It's just like anybody, like the kills, by the look of all of the kills, everybody dies. But this movie just arbitrarily chooses who somehow pulls through because we need them for another movie. We need you to think we're going to make the kills look absolutely brutal. Like, I wouldn't be surprised. Like, it would be actually funny if in uh, the next movie somebody gets beheaded, but they find a way to make them live, right? If this movie just completely jumps the shark, which that's what it would be. Or if somebody was doing a parody of this movie, of what these movies are now, where it's like somebody's like, gets stabbed 20 times and somehow lives like you can really easily make a parody of that let's take a quick break from this episode to talk about are you a fan of art movies and all things entertainment then you need to check out youtube.com slash inspired disorder our page is jam-packed with all kinds of great content including making of videos of the many faces and ongoing art series of abstract ink paintings but that's not all we also feature daily episodes from the ray taylor show a podcast that brings you movie reviews tv show reviews episode recaps opinion Opinions on news and entertainment and much more there's also a weekly diary and top five movie rankings of a variety of categories and if that wasn't enough we've also got how-to videos covering all kinds of topics so why wait head on over to youtube.com slash inspired disorder and start exploring the amazing content we have to offer and now back to the show and then you have the ghost face in this who wants to expose Sam, right? Wants to expose these conspiracy theories. They also use a gun, which is, you know, the whole thing with ghost face that he uses a knife. But there's multiple instances where they use a gun. He uses a gun. She uses a gun. They use a gun. However many. Uh, which obviously there are multiple in this one because we are in spoilers. And the reveal of who the killers are was like, and it, again, like people that looked like they died, like this movie kills people and then just arbitrarily brings them back and just explains it away. Like the girl, the daughter who roommate killed but not killed other guy killed but not killed the twins killed but not killed. there's a lot of that going on which kind of sucks because it's like it's just like it's you just can't trust anything then 
every single person, according to how this movie goes, could s- live. All you need, the only thing you need to have every single character in this movie live is to have an EMT come up and say, we've got a weak pulse. And then they will somehow pull through. They will somehow pull through. The character they brought back for like nostalgia reasons, which I don't think really works, kind of made this character worse, was Kirby from the fourth one. She's the FBI agent, right? And like assumed to be Ghostface Killer, which would make no sense. Like, th- it's amazing how when people put on the Ghostface costume, how like supernatural their strength becomes. And when they thought, when this movie for a moment was trying to make us think that Kirby was the Ghostface Killer, I was like, well, this is stupid. One, because it makes this character less. Like, it's just. And it's all done through like, oh, she went crazy, so that's why she's the killer, but then she's not the killer. So what, she just went crazy for no reason? And left the FBI, let go of the FBI for no re- Like, I don't know. There's so many disjointed and disconnected things that are just kind of told, like this movie tells you to believe a thing and you just have to go with it. You have the cute neighbor guy who's, like, dating Sam in secret, which doesn't make any sense why she would keep it a secret. It absolutely makes no sense. Like, if she's there, one, doesn't trust anybody, you would think that she wouldn't keep it a secret. Like, if he is potentially somebody that's going to be bad at some point, you would at least think, like, hey, people should know about this. I don't know. Like... I liked the character, but the way in which I like just there's like there's things I like about this movie and then like how it's done, how things are handled just is not not great. Of course, Gail Weathers is back. There's another thing where, you know, she writes another book and the lead girl is, you know, the Sydney character is angry and she goes to punch him. But this time Gail misses. So then the sister punches her. It's just like I don't like they're doing these things that happened in the previous movies just to do the things that happened in the previous movies and they don't really make it they're not necessary in any way like they they subvert it kind of by her dodging the first punch but i don't know like even her character is like just doesn't need to be there like she could have easily been written out like if, if for whatever reason if courtney cox demanded more money and they didn't get her to come back for this movie then this movie really wouldn't have changed at all. It really wouldn't have. There just wouldn't have been a kill scene in her massive apartment. Like, I don't know how she... Like, even if she's successful writing these books, like, that's like, you have to be, like, like a multimillionaire to live in the apartment that she's living in. I don't know. And then she's, like, with some other dude... Which I don't know if she was with some other dude in the last one, but I don't know. It just like that whole character. I like the care. I like the original characters, but I don't know. There's a little mention of Sydney that she took her husband and kids to a safe place when they heard about the thing, and Gail says she deserves to have her happy ending. Which, sure. There's a cop that kind of goes rogue after his daughter gets killed, quote unquote. And then when we find out the reveal of who he... That is the character. The cop is the character who is doing Matthew Lillard. Which that actor is not a Matthew Lillard. That actor is not a comedic actor whatsoever. But you could... Like, if I had really thought about it and had to predict, especially knowing the trend of these movies and they like to make the killer do a Matthew Lillard impersonation. This guy was kind of doing it throughout and it really went overboard when he kind of reveals himself as well as like the mystery, these, the magical survival of his kids that are also helping him. I still enjoyed the kind of twist of it, that he was the killer, that they are the family of Richie. Like that's cool. Fine. It makes, at least it makes sense why they would, you know, it gives some kind of reasoning why they would. Although the, scene in the theater is like the longest ex exposition 
which that theater it just doesn't make any sense the fact that everything all these collectibles all these pieces of evidence which i guess it makes sense that he's a cop he can get the evidence i guess but they're all under display cases and like it's very it's just like it's set at a theater because the second film is set at a theater but the reason the second film is set in a theater makes sense the reason why it's set in a theater here is only to reference the fact that the first movie, the second movie was, and this movie's doing a carbon copy in a lot of ways of the second movie, just with a lot more kills. Which the kills are fun, right? You have the alleyway kill in the beginning where he takes off his mask and you see, like, it's the first time we've, you know, a ghost face killer has taken their mask off at the beginning of the film. And the way they subvert that, I thought that was cool, interesting opening. I'm like, let's go. They're doing some new stuff. They're doing some interesting stuff. Finding out that he knew, like, as he's walking back to his apartment, passes Tara. So you see their connection there. It's like, okay, here we go. Like, I was very interested. And even in the apartment kill where, you know, he's doing hot and cold, which is the dumbest. Playing hide and seek in an apartment is the dumbest thing ever. But they do that, right, play hot and cold, and he finds his roommate chopped up in the refrigerator, and then he gets killed. I love that as well. Also seeing that in their apartment that, you know, they've got, like, the stab posters up. They got the two mannequin heads where they keep the masks. All that stuff was cool. You have the bodega kills, right? They're chasing after Tara and Sam. They go into a bodega because we're in New York, so you got to have a bodega scene. Um, you know, some cool things there, although the – killer the ghost face killer uses the shotgun which it's not on brand it would have been fine if he picked it up and oh it's out of bullets he throws it away and gets his knife okay but whatever the therapist kill is interesting trying to kind of set sam up right breaking through the window smashing his head and stabbing him in the face there was a lot of face stabbing in this movie as well you have the other apartment, you have Tara and Sam's apartment kills, where you have the cute boy, right, trying to get their attention, which he's supposed to be their neighbor, but somehow he has a window that can look into her roommate's room? That set up the logistics of that, and he can't get there, whatever. But still a cool thing, right? Gruesome kills, right? Think that the cop's daughter gets killed, but of course that's fake. I get like I don't know. The Mindy's girlfriend gets like stabbed and then like the knife gets cut up her her abdomen and somehow she lives. Like she lives long enough to hide in that room and then be the last one to start crossing the ladder and then gets like I was expecting when Ghostface was shaking this girl on Mindy on the ladder, I was expecting her guts to fall out. Because she had just had her stomach s cut open with this knife. Knife all the way in, goes up about four or five inches. Right, I'm expecting guts to start pouring out of this girl. Which would have been probably the goriest place this these movies have ever gone. But doesn't happen. But it's still a brutal, when she falls, smashes her head on the, the, uh, the dumpster. Brutal brutal uh gail's apartment kind of a fun fight unnecessary gail being in this movie so unnecessary the fact that her boyfriend this big athletic black dude just kind of gets manhandled and then to think that it's i mean it would have to be the cop the cop is the only one that maybe would have the strength definitely not the daughter definitely not the virgin but when they when like this movie's trying to make you think it's Kirby for like a hot minute, it just made no sense. I mean, it made sense because she could have been, but doesn't make sense with the physical stature and physical strength. The subway scene I thought was great, very thrilling, right? The way uh, the what's her face almost died, you know. Mindy almost how many almost died and then you have the theater like the the end battle at the theater which the theater is just stupid oh it's a kill box 
Why is there a cage? I don't, like, a lot of that setup is just kind of stupid. Chad clearly getting stabbed like 20 times by two people. Two ghost faces stabbing him a bunch of times. Somehow he survives. Dumb. You have the cop going full Matthew Lillard. Dumb. Finding out that it's Richie's family. Interesting. And the cop kind of doing a cross between Matthew Lillard and Mel Gibson. Like I could almost see. I think Mel Gibson would have pulled off a Matthew Lillard far more than the, the cop in this movie. And so much exposition, right? Because they got to explain everything. This is like usually the part of the whodunit that I like, right? Where everything's laid out. You find out all the things. You see how all the pieces are connected. But it's so unsatisfying because this movie's not as, like, it's not like a well-written whodunit. It just uses lines of dialogue to excuse people surviving that have no business surviving. And the, the stab when Tara stabs the uh, the virgin in the mouth, very gruesome. You know, tons of blood, another face stabby moment. You have, there's a scene where Sam runs at the cop. Cop's got a gun in his hand. Run, like, rah! Right? She's out of bullets, so she just decides to run at him. He decides to run at her instead of just pointing the gun and pulling the trigger. And they fall off the balcony for some reason. Like, just, like, one of the dumbest moments in this was that scene. Where they, like, run into each... Like, they almost run into each other. Like, aggressively hug each other. And then fall off the balcony. And then her doing the fast stabby thing. Because that's that's what she got from Billy Loomis. She's a fast stabber. I don't know. Some fun kills. You know, I still think there's potential for these newer movies to be great but i'm not holding my breath right they're not horrible they had some fun kills i think they focus on you know i if, if they just focused on the mystery more focused on some of the writing more right make the mystery better maybe not focus like whatever this flesh out this billy loomis thing make that somehow pay off in a interesting way other than just her ability to stab fast but i'm okay with each movie taking place like if this is like in these movies is like them moving to another place like we got to move away from this like everyone is like we're moving away just if only to you know show different cities like let's see a, a screen movie in new orleans let's see a screen movie in uh florida let's see a screen movie in you know Wisconsin, you know, I don't know. I just think there's a lot of potential for these movies for this franchise. And, you know, it doesn't kind of feel squandered. But either way, I want to thank you for tuning in to this episode of The Ray Taylor Show. I hope you enjoyed my thoughts on these newest Scream movies, Scream 6. Uh, don't forget to tune in every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for new reviews on movies and TV shows. And join the conversation by leaving a comment or rating on your favorite podcast platform, or over on youtube.com slash inspired disorder. Uh, but until next time, enjoy the show. New episodes of The Ray Taylor Show come out every single day. Subscribe on YouTube and everywhere our podcasts are found. Binge the full week over at inspireddisorder.com slash plus. Buy Ray Taylor Show merch over at inspireddisorder.com. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Peace. Ouch! Today is, is the, the day, day where, where you wake, wake up and you realize that everything that you've been dreaming about, everything that you've been wanting, every goal and wish and hope that you've ever had can become real. Dreams can come true. What you manifest in your mind, you can bring to reality.